people question me after that, uh, even through calls, asking me, how is it related to Makassid uh, Sharia? Uh, this I'm going to tell you now uh, quickly uh, as a teaser. And if you have time later, maybe uh, I will try to make it uh, as a proper lecture. Okay. So if you look at Makassid uh, Sharia, uh, it is uh, basically can be divided into three. I think uh, I'm just going to repeat this again, Daruria, then the uh, cities uh, where we identify five different areas, religion, life, intellect, lineage and properties, and the hajiyat, the needs, and the taksinia, uh, the luxuries. So here is where uh, we we need to, uh, to see clearly uh, how does uh, uh, SDG fit in into this uh, Makassid uh, Sharia. So if you look at it, the Makassid Sharia itself, let me define it again so that uh, we are on the same uh, platform. So the necessities, the daruriyah, uh, further classified, like I've said, just now the five different areas. And there is also the hajiyat. And the hajiyat, if you look at it, if you look at all the literatures, it doesn't detail out. Uh, it doesn't detail out uh, very much. Uh, even though there are some scholars that already uh, list down some of them. I think UIA is one of the university have list some of this Makassid uh, Sharia. Uh, but mostly uh, we have no agreement with regard to the needs or uh, the hajiyat. Uh, and we have the luxuries. The luxuries, I think everybody agreed because uh, when we see luxuries, it is always from the Muslim country. MashaAllah, astaghfirullah al-azim. Sometimes if you look at it. So... Where is SDG? SDG actually is just the needs because SDG is talking about the needs of the people. So according to 3,000 uh, researchers uh, that we discussed about it, we were just looking at the needs of the human. So with different background, with different religion, with different countries, we agreed on the 17, on the 17. So if you talk about Makassid uh, Sharia, Makassid Sharia is much higher in that sense. There is Daruria, but uh, in uh, SDG, we only have uh, the needs only. So that means the second part of the Makassid Sharia, the Hajiyat, and we identify it as 17. So I think uh, I'll stop at that. Uh, maybe uh, you have any question, then we can discuss further. Okay. Uh, Prof, uh, yeah, you can stop and uh, share the screen. Uh, Prof okay. okay, Jazakumullah Khair, Prof. Dr. Kamara Zizi, uh, that uh, uh, share with us the Makashi Sharia and uh, the sister of the goal. We, uh, uh, Prof, uh, what are we? Yes, go ahead. Prof. One question. Assalamu alaikum. Ah, bro, uh, yes, uh, Brother Zahri, see that. Yes. Just like to ask uh, Brother Kamarul, uh -huh. uh, how many nations already embrace USD, uh, the SDG, SDG, managing their cities or their country? Okay. Have, um, yeah. I think almost all United Nations members have already signed. When they were signing it in September uh, 2015, uh, our... Uh, Prime Minister was there also, he signed it. Uh, so again, my only uh, <laughs> statement after that is, I don't know who advised him on that. And I think um, if I want to put a figure, it's about 215 countries have signed. Uh, there's only about uh, 230 countries in the world, uh, not 500 that we are been uh, mentioned earlier. Yes, yes, so, <laughs> yes. I, I agree with you. They signed, but how many of them really got the SDG implemented? Because they they were talking about Agenda 21 all these years, and uh, to migrate to SDG, I've not heard any country have done it yet. Okay, thank you for reminding, uh, because I, I gave that lecture uh, for one hour here and I did discuss about uh, Agenda 21 and all those before. So uh, it'll be a long story again. I'm just a teacher here. Okay, okay, I, I, okay. I, okay, Prof. Waramli, uh, Brother I Zahri, Prof. Pro I was a city councillor. Okay, no, no problem, I've Brother Zahri. The, the development, okay. but uh, it, it ended up being a joke. 
Okay. Okay, Prof uh, Zari ada uh, uh, Prof uh, Ramli is on live now. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Okay, okay. Uh, Salam. Saya punya video ada problem sikit. Saya akan masuk balik. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, Prof Ramli uh, will come back insyaallah. Uh, yes, um, uh, now we have uh, engineers now uh, in, in our forum. Uh, we have uh, IDE started uh, broadcasting now. Who? IDE. IDE, IDE, yeah, okay. Hmm. All right. Uh, so we can uh, uh, discuss uh, anything. Uh, of course, Makasih Syarang is very important. And, uh, and SDG, I think, is no harm to sustain uh, the, the life. Uh, I mean, uh, in, in, but unfortunately, it's designed by United Nations. But Prof. Kamaro is involved with the, uh, with the part of designing. And he told us last, I think, last previous talk that um, some of the proposal has been made, but uh, of course, they 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 declined to apply, isn't it? Well, yeah. Well, Kamaro Azizi. That's true. That's true. But I think no harm we can uh, uh, use uh, SDG in our own version. We don't have to follow them hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, Prof. Ramli is in now, but he's unmute. Uh, Prof. Ramli, uh, while waiting for Ramli uh, uh, connection, I would like to read. Uh, his uh, 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 introduce him by the way. Uh, Ramli is a professor in uh, hydrogen fuel. He's Alhamdulillah. He's also chair of uh, Petronas, and um, he's uh, his paper. Or, yeah, Prof. Ramli. Yeah, we now do not. Eh? Um, I have some problem with the camera, lah. Camera. Uh, but can, can you share your screen? Okay, I introduce him. Um, uh, he is outstanding scholarly work has earned himself as the uh, highest scientific accolade as one of uh, Thomson Reuters, the world's most influential mind 2016. He also won the Merdeka Award year 2016 and um, his uh, paper been cited more than 14,000 times and his age index is more than uh, 56. So this is uh, our uh, brothers uh, uh, of Dr. Warambi Wandaud, uh, Datuk Professor IR, Dr. Warambi Wandaud uh, achievement. And uh, uh, he told me one hour ago his computer crashed. So he's just uh, recovering, yes. Now uh, share the screen. Yeah, you can share the screen now. Yeah, we we can. Prof, you can start. Even though we cannot see your voice, but you can start now. You can see your face, but you can. Hello, Prof Waramli. Can you unmute? Yeah, can you unmute, Prof One? Your your screen is on. Yeah. Prof. Rambi, are you on? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, he's a chairman of Hydrogen Economy Special Interest Group, Academy Science uh, Malaysia, a fellow Academy Science of Malaysia, founding president of Malaysian Association of Hydrogen Energy. President of Academy of Islamic Science Malaysia, Asasi, and currently Petronas Chair of uh, prof, uh, Professor of Sustainable Hydrogen Energy, and uh, still uh, serve UKM. And uh, okay, Prof. Ramli, go ahead. You can start now. Uh, I'm trying to uh, actually. Um, yeah. You can use the arrow. Uh, this is a uh, acrobat, isn't it? Can you can just use no, the nah. arrow? Jangan nak nak keluar daripada sharing ni nak share another another window. 
Ah, you just stop sharing on the top there. Stop, ah, yeah. So okay. you stop sharing, then go to another file. All right. I I will. Uh... Okay, this is PowerPoint. You can start uh, show the screen. Yeah, go ahead. Share share the screen. Okay, Tafalo. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Alhamdulillah bi alamin salatu wassalamu ala syafi'i anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Ah, pertama sekali saya minta maaf lah um, kerana lambat sikit sebab okay. ada masalah dengan komputer dia crash. Crash. Tak <laughs> ni juga ada crash, tak lepas yeah. apa. Kamera pun dah tak dah, dah, dah tak boleh on. Tak apa, suara cukup dengan <laughs> PowerPoint. Ah, jadi kita makan masa. Jadi mungkin kawan-kawan tak boleh tengok saya lah. Tapi tak apa, Tapi kita kenal. Tengok kawan-kawan insyaallah insyaallah ya ya okey thank um, you so the um, uh, what i want to talk today is about sustainable uh, hydrogen energy yeah? uh-huh. which is uh, a future clean low carbon energy and um, i would like to suggest this for the muslim world yeah mm-hmm. and um, as uh, prof farzan has said uh, that uh, uh i am the uh chair professor for uh sustainable hydrogen energy uh, and um, all my work uh, is mainly on hydrogen energy from 1995 mm. so today i would like to share my view on uh hydrogen energy and how we could make it uh, a future clean low carbon energy for the muslim world now if you look at the um energy resources for global electrical generation you will see that a lot of it uh, is still fossil energy yeah almost uh, uh, nearly 70% eh? up to 70% and it's de- declining down to about uh, less than 60% now so we're replacing it with uh, hydro uh, which is already being used by most people uh, most countries and then you can see at the top there renewable energy coming in uh, starting from the 1970s during the kyoto protocol uh, days yeah and now we have the cop uh, 21 in 2015 so you can see by 2015 is scored already uh, nearly about eight seven to eight percent yeah uh, of the uh, total electrical generation so just looking at the electrical generation only because that would be the most uh, amount of energy being used um, so uh, world energy supply is about 571.4 eka joule and the consumption is uh, slightly less, 392.9 ekajoule. And as I've said earlier, um, in the uh, before uh, COP um, 15, uh, 21, the fossil fuel being used about 80 to 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of the fuel, which is not only for electrical generation but being used for other other uh, form of energy. Uh, so the amount is about 80 to 90 percent so 80 to 90 percent of our energy comes from fossil fuel yeah? that's quite a lot uh, so and this has caused uh, greenhouse gas emission and we know that this has caused uh, global warming and climate change um, and the world has tried to come to an agreement uh, finally in cop 21 in Paris, but they're still squabbling about it after so many years already. It's already five years now since COP21, uh, but we haven't, we still haven't got a, 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 a proper agreement on uh, the uh, plan of action. Yeah, uh, for example, at the Paris uh, Agreement, um, all the parties want, uh, were committed to strengthen global response to keep temperature rise below 2 degrees C but the island nations uh, were afraid that by 2 degrees C they will be submerged 
Mm. So they are trying to push uh, for 1.5 degrees C so that they won't be submerged by the time um, the temperature rise uh, by two degrees before the world will take action. Yeah. So so there's still some uh, some uh, argument about this some debate and it hasn't come to uh, it because the the richer countries uh, insist on two degrees C. Yeah, because they don't want to spend more money than they they should now. So they want to delay it, uh, but the the island nation, especially, uh, they are going to be inundated by by the sea sea level rise. Yeah, if the temperature rise another two degrees C, so it's still. So um, what are most countries uh, is is doing now is to diversify their energy or fuel resources. Yeah, so. Most would go for renewable energy, which is um, most of the uh, technology are already quite mature. So you have biomass, biofuel, solar energy, wind energy. These are the four main ones. Um, and some advanced uh, OECD countries like Japan, uh, US, you know, some parts of US like California, uh, Europe, yeah, most of Europe, um, China, Japan, and South Korea, they are all going for um hydrogen energy nuclear i think everyone has uh, is not uh, in favor of uh, the public yeah, because of the fukushima uh, disaster and um, so most yeah most Uh, we lost you. Yeah, Prof. Ramli, we, your voice. Hello, Prof. Ramli. Hello. 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 Uh, maybe I call him. Hello. Ah, so tak ada eh? Ah, okay, okay. Ah? We're frozen. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum. Um, we're waiting for uh, Prof. Warambi. He's a... Uh, he's, uh, this computer not really crash, but hang. I don't know whether it's crash, <laughs> but he he will uh, recover soon, inshallah. Um, maybe we can can discuss among us first uh, while waiting from Prof. Ramli. Uh, Dato' Rahim Nick is also there. Uh, Dr. Rahim, you can say something. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Fauzan. Yes. Uh, well, uh, before that, I uh, I was in the uh, Ministry of Environment and Animal Resources at one time. Yes. Uh, during that time, uh, we developed uh, in response to the... At that time, we have no, no Paris Agreement yet. We have a Copenhagen Accord. Uh -huh. So in response to that, we developed a roadmap of emission intensity reduction in Malaysia because Prime Minister Najib went, went to Copenhagen to announce 40% reduction of a GHG emission mm -hmm. to two or two or five level. But uh, in that report, uh, at that time, uh, there's some uh, a scenario for using uh, renewable energy. Mm -hmm. But during that time, this uh, using of hydrogen fuel has not been put in the in the forecast. Instead, they, they put uh, nuclear power. Mm -hmm. That's why at that time, there was already an uh, outfit to search for site Mm -hmm. to locate the energy, uh, uh, nuclear energy mm -hmm. uh, under Prime Minister Department. I, uh, I know the chairman also some people from TMP were part of that outfit. Mm -hmm. And how after the new uh, government, I mean uh, the, the previous government mm -hmm. in power, they quickly, uh, I mean, uh, dismantled this outfit already. So now the option for nuclear power 
is out. It's out. Therefore, I'm not sure maybe now we can convince the government to look at this uh, hydrogen uh, fuel mm -hmm. as an um, alternative. Because looking at the report by international agency, including McKinsey, in order for us to go for transition from now to, uh, uh, we call it 1.5% increase or 2.2% uh, degrees uh, centigrade reduction, we need about 80 to 80, uh, 70 to 80% reduction in use of fossil fuel. So mm. I'm not sure how, how feasible is that, but that is the study now. So of course, um, renewable energy feature very well, including hydrogen fuel. And I saw, I saw my colleague here, uh, Datuk Dr. Abu Bakar, Professor Abu Bakar Jaffa, former DG of DOE also here. He oh, also yes. proponent of uh, not only hydrogen fuel, but also OTEC. Maybe afterwards you can say something while waiting okay, for- Okay, next, Prof. Abu Bakar, Abu Bakar Jaffa. Yes. Yes. I said, Datuk. Datuk, can you on your mic? Uh, mute, unmute the, the mic. Yes, Prof. Uh, Datuk, uh -huh, sit down. Try to find the- uh, Yes. The icon. Ah, yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you can show your face also, Rado. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking for the icon now. Hang on. Somewhere there, somewhere there. Okay, hey, all right. Now you see me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So I've been uh, looking at the conversion of uh, solar energy into hydrogen since 1975. Mashallah. You know? uh -huh. A long time ago. And one of the major components of solar energy, that is the amount of heat stored in the ocean. Mm. They call it ocean thermal energy. And, and since 1975 till 2006 and 7, I didn't know whether in Malaysia we have this uh, potential. Sasha and see under the Prime Minister's Department. And we are breaking, breaking, uh, Dato. Yeah, okay. yeah. We we did a survey on. Uh, are there Professor Ramli is there? Yeah, Professor yeah. Ramli. All right. Okay, Prof. You are, okay. Dato, can you say a last word because Professor Ramli is in? Yeah. Okay. So we discovered that we do have uh, ocean thermal potential of the Sabah and Sarawak, actually in deep waters, uh, about eight hundred meters, you know, and beyond. So we, and I think to my estimate, very conservative, the potential capacity in terms of power capacity, what, 20,000 uh, megawatts. So okay. I stop there. Okay, thank you. Alhamdulillah, Prof. Ramli is in now. Now we can see his uh, face. Prof. Ramli is uh, connecting the video, audio. But with, uh, just now, Prof. Ramli, uh, uh, Dato Rahimdik and Dato uh, Abu Kajafa talk a bit about uh, the initiative in Malaysia. Now you can continue. They can uh, add on later. Prof. Ramli, connect. Uh, the audio is still connecting. Yeah. Uh, unmute, please, uh, Dr. Ramli. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay. No problem. Inshallah, inshallah. Saya akan cuba share screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Okay, kita sambung okay. balik. Yeah. Um, so at the same time, most countries uh, invest in uh, development of green technology including uh, low or zero emission um, clean energy yeah? uh, like bioenergy and so on yeah? so this is uh, the uh, electrical generation capacity from renewable energy yeah throughout the world and you can see that um, starting from 2000 um, uh, renewable energy there's a lot more renewable energy being um, implemented, yeah? and um, uh, the main uh, renewable energy, of course, is hydro. 
although in Malaysia hydro is not included in the in the uh, renewable energy, yeah, hydro is a separate uh, classification. But the rest of the world um, include uh, hydro as renewable energy. So that's what you see at the bottom there, the blue, the light blue uh, bar too. That's hydro. But in Malaysia, uh, hydro is not classified as renewable. Yeah? So that's accident of history, okay? And Prabhakar is senyum macam tu. Tanya dia lah dulu-dulu. Mini hydro uh, included, mini hydro. Yeah. Now, if you look at the COP21, uh, uh, um, uh, the um, uh, apa ni? carbon emission, uh, historically you have a rise of carbon emission and um, in 2015, the parties agreed uh, to, what do you call it, um, a change in policy to invest in um, uh, zero emission technology, yeah, and to, um, so you can see there are several uh, trajectory there. Um, uh, if it, you continue, um, without uh, the pledges, you see the, the highest rise in the uh, emission. Yeah? And then, of course, you have the, the other uh, scenarios, yeah? the INTC trajectory, and then the two degrees uh, trajectory, of course, is it will reduce the, the um, carbon emission until it reaches zero at around 2050. Yeah? That, that's the, the plan, yeah? Uh, but as I told you, that um, uh, two degrees C, uh, um, the island nation uh, might be uh, flooded first, yeah? Uh, before uh, the, um, uh, before the whatever um, uh, action that has been taken could take effect yeah uh, because it's been too late uh, if you wait for two degrees C. but that's that's what has been agreed at cop 21 and you can see the two degrees trajectory coming down and will theoretically reach zero around 2050 or maybe up to 2060 yeah that's the the hope of the people there um now let's look at the muslim world uh, energy scenario yeah so if you look at the primary energy production yeah um, so the Muslim world I, I uh, took the OIC lah yeah most of the Muslim world are in the OIC and uh, the, the energy production yeah um, is from OIC countries is the the blue the, the dark blue one yeah? the total is the the um, uh, orange, yeah. The darker orange is uh, non OIC developing country, and the developed country uh, production of uh, energy is the grey one. Okay, so but the consumption is uh, less, yeah. So Muslim world produce around. Uh, 21 to 25 percent of the total energy of the world, yeah, uh, but only consume around 9 to 30 percent, so about half of the uh, total energy yeah, uh, of the world, yeah. So the other half they export to uh, the developing, uh, sorry, the other countries, including the developed countries as well. Um, so what about um, the renewable? energy so we just look at the uh, world uh, world uh, renewable energy according to region yeah? and you can see of course the eu and central asia they were blocked together uh, were the largest yeah the largest uh, uh, user of renewable energy yeah uh, so uh, compared to um, the uh, the Muslim countries are mainly in the Middle East, 
uh, South Asia, half of, well, one third of South Asia, um, and the Middle East. So um, the total uh, for South Asia and MENA is about um, about uh, five thousand two hundred. Yeah, five thousand two hundred. Um, I'm not sure what. Um, I think million kiloton uh, equivalent. Yeah. So um, it's not very much. Um, and um, if you break down the uh, the countries, um, you can see that Turkey has the largest, yeah, the largest uh, proportion yeah, of the, yeah, and a lot of it uh, is uh, uh, wind and hydro. Eh? Uh, Mal Malaysia is also listed there, yeah, and we are mostly. Uh, biomass yeah? and solar okay biomass and solar pv yeah? specifically yeah? these are the two main uh, renewable energy uh, being implemented in malaysia yeah uh, wind um, is not uh, there's not much wind energy resources in malaysia uh, wave also not very much uh, only um, uh, solar and biomass. Yeah? So that's that's our our strike the biomass. Yeah? Um, um, you can see, of course, the uh, Saudi Arabia have hardly been shown here because they are uh, they, they are uh, exporting oil, so they use a lot of oil instead. Yeah? So. Um, but uh, you can see that um, the more developed um, uh, countries, they have the most uh, uh, population, yeah, would have the most uh, renewable energy, like uh, Turkey, Indonesia, and Pakistan. Yeah, Iran. Iran has some uh, nuclear energy, um, yeah, and as well as uh, Iran. Yeah, so these two countries have uh, nuclear. But the rest have biomass, small hydro, uh, solar. Yeah. Um, there are two types. Yeah. In Malaysia, we only use photovoltaic PV. But uh, in in other in the Middle East, for example, they use they, they also use concentrated uh, solar. Yeah. Uh, so CSP. Yeah. Uh, but we we don't have that kind of intensity. Uh, sunlight yeah then sunlight to, to be able to use the concentrated concentration type uh, uh, power yeah it's concentrated type solar energy okay let's let's look for those who are not familiar with the energy policy in malaysia i would like to just uh, run through yeah so we started out in 1974 when we discovered oil so we have uh, the Petroleum Development Act, 1974. Yeah, I was uh, um, I was just uh, I went to Australia at that time doing matriculation. Yeah, 74, right? Uh, 73 was MCE, so 74 uh, Petronas was established, and then in 1975, um, Malaysian government developed the National Petroleum Policy. Yeah, how to manage our petroleum resources. Yeah. So the Petroleum Development Act established uh, Petronas, and then the National Petroleum Policy um, is the instrument uh, that Petronas will use to uh, uh, to manage our pet oil and gas resources. Yeah, and uh, and then uh, you can see se several um, um, political development. In '73, we we have the uh, Arab-Israeli war, and followed by the Arab oil embargo. Yeah, and you can see the price of oil going up. Yeah, uh, from uh, around uh, 15 to around 40 plus yeah, uh, dollars per barrel. And that's when we have our national petroleum policy. Yeah, because we 
we want to to be able to, to control our export and then uh, we have our national energy policy in 1979 uh, the Iranian evolution uh, precipitated a, a spike yeah, that goes on until the Iran Iraq war yeah, that's when the supply of oil uh, was uh, not secure so the price went up to about 80 and then uh, we uh, started to have what we call the national de depletion policy in 1980 yeah, to make sure that we don't run out of our oil reserve yeah we should manage yeah uh, at a time when the price of oil is very high yeah and, and then of course the price of oil start to go down uh, because the Saudis are producing uh, a lot yeah, to after the embargo they suddenly suddenly open it up I think this is the influence of the American to reduce the price of oil um, and then um, the price of oil was around 30 30 dollars yeah and then there was the uh, Iran Iraq war yeah, in 19 uh, 19 yeah but before that um, we have another policy called the four fuel diversification policy of 1981 yeah um, we don't uh, ask me why they call it fuel but that's that's what they call it I think this is uh, TNB yeah because this is actually for electrical generation yeah this four fuel is for electrical generation uh, so you have petroleum um, natural gas coal and hydro right um, so hydro is classified as a fuel okay um, but later on we will add a fifth fuel again uh, the the technology is fuel but it's actually we are adding renewable energy but that renewable energy does not include hydro so this is the quote of the uh, national fuel uh, energy policy so um so the price uh, uh, of oil had a spike up to 50 us dollars per barrel in 1990 yeah 1991 and then it stabilized down to about 30 and then you have the asian financial crisis in 1998 1996 sorry um the price went down further down below 20 and then uh to increase the price yeah opec cuts uh, target so the price went up again and then you have the 9 11 attack yeah and um, at the same time um the ministry of energy uh, at that time was keta yeah keta uh, uh keta well, before there was a um, um, Ministry of Energy and Water, uh, not sure what the name is, but um, at that time, there were discussion to include uh, renewable energy. Yeah, I remember there was a World Renewable Energy Network uh, Congress in Malaysia in 1999, uh, where um, we, uh, the uh, Institute, uh, Institute uh, Tenaga Malaysia, yeah um uh, decided to send a, a, a memo to the prime minister yeah? although the ministry has already been discussing about renewable energy but um, with the uh, congress world renewable energy congress being held in malaysia at that time so uh, the uh, the government uh, was was uh, lobbied yeah? to start uh, thinking about renewable energy and in 2001 uh, 2001 uh, the fifth fuel policy was uh, uh, approved and the fifth fuel is renewable energy yeah so uh, we still retain the uh, fuel uh, terminology yeah and then in 2006 um, uh, keta so the name is already changed to Keta by that time. Uh, commission, yeah, uh, Pusat Tenaga Malaysia PTM, which is now Green Tech, to uh, undertake 
uh, roadmap for solar energy, hydrogen energy, and fuel cell. Yeah. Again, uh, accident of history. You have solar together with hydrogen, uh, and also fuel cell. Yeah. Um, because uh, the uh, because it's being um, the researchers are doing a lot of work on fuel cells, uh, and therefore you have uh, this uh, actually uh, included as well, solar, hydrogen, and fuel cell as well. Um, so managed to get out the the roadmap in 2006. At that time, the case KSU was. Um, uh uh KSU will add that to um Halim Shafi, sorry. Dato Halim Shafi, who later became the chairman of the MCMC later on. Yeah. So he was the KSU and he uh took down all our recommendation and um when all the uh when the EPU uh, started um, uh, putting together the ninth Malaysia plan, he managed to slip in some of the early uh, recommendation of the roadmap yeah, for the ninth Malaysia plan for the five years that he... So it appears... Uh, so part of the roadmap appeared in the ninth Malaysia plan. If you look at the ninth Malaysia, Malaysia plan document on energy, you will see uh, a few... Uh, like uh, uh, what do you call it awareness campaign for hydrogen energy and solar and so on yeah um, and then um, there was a global financial collapse as you remember yeah in 2008 yeah 2008 there was a global financial collapse um, <coughs> the price price of oil went down uh, from uh, 125 I think uh, went down to about uh, 45 dollars yeah. uh, and OPEC um, OPEC uh, cuts target to increase the price so you, you can see the price goes up uh, further yeah and then at the same time, 2006, uh, we also have the national biofuel policy where um, the government has uh, mandated uh, the B5 and, and then B10, uh, what do you call it, uh, biodiesel blend yeah, with the normal diesel, with the petroleum diesel uh, at, the, uh, service, uh, at the petrol station. Yeah. Now, I think it is B20 now. So that policy is still there, but it's not available in all uh, all uh, service station, but it's growing. Uh, but uh, the problem is, of course, the price of uh, palm oil also um, uh, was quite expensive, and therefore it's, it's, it's uh, difficult to sell uh, biofuel, biodiesel. Lah. This biofuel actually in Malaysia is biodiesel. Lah. Biofuel could be uh, bioethanol, yeah, which is being used in Brazil, for example. But in Malaysia, biofuel means, uh, in this case, uh, biodiesel. Yeah. And then in 2010, when the price of oil has recovered, yeah, somewhat up to 80, um, we have the renewable energy roadmap in 2010, yeah, and uh, that. Renewable energy roadmap covers uh, the solar, solar PV, solar thermal, um, build, building uh, integrated uh, PV, and so on. Yeah. So it's a it's more encompassing, uh, all encompassing uh, roadmap, where um, uh, the roadmap is, is about uh, all of the renewable energy, including also biomass. And then 2011, the government, uh, the parliament approved Renewable Energy Act 2011 and um, SEDA was established in 2012. This is to accelerate the implementation of renewable energy through the fit in tariff, yeah, where you can, um, you can have your solar 
photovoltaic or biomass, um, but you can sell to the grid at a lower uh, tariff in the first year, and then um, the tariff will rise uh, until it reaches the uh, uh, conventional tariff lah, after three years. Yeah. Uh, but the quota for FIT has finished, and the FIT program has, has finished, and now it's uh, uh, net metering. Yeah. Net metering, I mean, uh, whatever you can sell, uh, you you they will deduct from your from your uh, bill. Yeah. All right. So uh, net metering now. So SEDA is still there. Um, SEDA is the Sustainable Energy Development Authority. Yeah. So that agency is still there. And then you have the U.S. Shale, yeah, and Canadian Oil Sands, uh, which is cheaper. So the price of oil went down again, yeah, down to about forty, yeah, and um, um, and then of course the uh, Iran uh, sanction, and then um, uh, in twenty seventeen, the Academy of Science Malaysia um, commissioned another study called the Fuel Cell Hydrogen industry blueprint yeah, uh, in 2017 uh, which uh, revised the uh, original uh, hydrogen and fuel cell uh, roadmap in 2006 yeah and now we're trying to uh, include the, the revised uh, roadmap uh, for hydrogen energy and fuel cell in the transition plan but unfortunately uh, we have COVID-19, so I'm not sure what is happening right now, uh, whether uh, we could uh, uh, we could go ahead with the, uh, hydrogen energy as one of the uh, uh, energy being being uh, looked at for the 12th Malaysia plan in Malaysia. Right, now, there are three types three main types of energy um, you have uh, fossil fuel of course fossil energy um, that's uh, quite a lot 80 to 90 percent of our energy comes from fossil fuel and then you have renewable energy yeah uh, biomass uh, solar photovoltaic so th solar thermal solar concentration concentrated power uh, also wind power and uh, wave and tidal yeah and then you have alternative energy which is uh, nuclear and hydrogen yeah alternative energy is um, zero emission in terms of carbon yeah? zero carbon emission but uh, it has its own uh, problem um, uh, fossil energy of course you have higher co2 emission yeah uh, biomass and biofuel you have uh, especially biofuel you have uh, competition with uh, crops yeah uh, for example uh, biofuel in the us uh, comes mainly from corn but corn is the staple food for south americans yeah and most of the corn in south america uh, is imported yeah, from the us so uh, so there'll be a competition between uh, biofuel uh, made from corn and food yeah, in, in South America. And, and that's why in South America, biofuel is not corn, it's from, <coughs> it's from sugarcane. Yeah? Because they can't use corn because that's their staple food. It's like uh, using rice, our rice to, to make... Uh, uh, make tapai and then convert it into biofuel, eh? uh, bioethanol. You can make bioethanol from rice if you want to, but then the price of rice will go up, and then you know uh, people cannot eat rice. Okay? Uh, um, solar um, and uh, um, other renewable energy type, uh, high cost, but solar now is is. Uh, the cost of solar is now going down yeah um, because there are more uh, large scale solar being being implemented all over the world 
and the demand is so high and uh, therefore the price has gone gone down per kilowatt yeah? uh, because of the competition yeah? to supply the uh, photovoltaic cell uh, all over the world yeah um, the other problem for uh, solar energy is of course uh, uh, seasonal variability yeah for um, nuclear you have radiation and and profileration yeah profileration means that uh, it could be used to make nuclear weapon yeah uh, that's what happened in uh, pakistan and india and china yeah um, hydrogen the, the uh, energy combustion device very high efficiency up to 50 60 percent um, for high temperature fuel cell you can go up to 80 percent yeah and zero emission yeah because it just uh, emit water but it has its problem yeah hydrogen uh, at the moment is quite costly um, and uh, for uh, um, all the R&D effort and commercialization effort are focused on reducing the cost yeah, per unit kilogram of hydrogen, which I will show later on, and uh, also the, the cost of the energy combustion device, the fuel cell, uh, down to uh, to be competitive with uh, internal combustion engine. Yeah, and um, uh, before we uh, actually look at how we why we should uh, choose hydrogen or renewable energy instead of uh, continuing to use fuel cell yeah it's because the we we um because of the climate change yeah but how do you decide okay so i would like to talk about uh, technology selection yeah my my own view of technology selection and also what Islam teaches us uh, on this. So, most past technologies uh, were invented out of curiosity, mainly, yeah, uh, aesthetics or practical needs, yeah, because uh, um, uh, the mother of invention is the needs, yeah. Uh, needs are the mother of invention, some people say, yeah, that uh, any uh, community needs something, so someone will come along and invent something to, to meet the needs of the community, right? So they were neither planned deliberately by government nor by companies. Yeah, only technology for warfare or waste generation attracted government and company. Yeah, because if they can they can fight better in war. They can win a war, or if they can make tons of money, they they would like to know what the technology is all about. So before the Second World War, you have uh, industrial laboratories in the United States. Uh, most famous would be. Um, the, the um, what do you call it? The Thomas Alva Edison uh, Laboratory, yeah? uh, as well as the Bell Laboratories. Yeah? Uh, these uh, two laboratories are where they solve industrial problem yeah? in their own uh, industrial sector. For example, Bell mainly in the electrical uh, industry, yeah? uh, as well as Edison. Yeah? Um, and then, of course, um, uh, after, during the war, um, <coughs> the U.S. Uh, managed to develop uh, atomic and, or nuclear bomb, yeah, um, using the scientists, eh, scientists and engineers in what they call the Manhattan Project. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with Manhattan; it's just a code name, yeah. Their main laboratories are out in the desert in Los Alamos, yeah, and uh, uh, and they managed to uh, deliver eh, the uh, atomic bomb, and it was of course headed by Bush, yeah, uh, nothing to do with the with uh, the two pre uh, two Bushes eh, two two president uh, by the same name, uh, but he was a. Uh, 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 an administration official and he took over as the um, shall I say the manager yeah? so in 1945 he wrote a, a paper uh, in which he said that we must continue uh, to fund uh, laboratories like this in order to develop 
uh, more advanced weapon and and then of course you have uh, darpa and so on yeah now history of technology has shown that technology selected for profit or national security had damaged the environment and threatened human life on a major scale yeah um the atomic nuclear bomb uh, the more nuclear bombs yeah, hydrogen bomb as you call it um, and then you have the uh, bio weapons yeah and some people uh, suspect that the um, covid-19 is is a, a bio weapon yeah um, gone uh, roach yeah someone had leaked it out or something but it hasn't been proven i was told so um and if you look at global warming it was only after clear evidence of global warming uh, caused by greenhouse gas emission and its effect on climate change that many government and companies realized the urgency of abandoning greenhouse gas emitting technology yeah so the environment has been damaged climate has changed then we decide to to try to soft it. but it's it may be a bit too late yeah right because yeah as you can see in the graph the carbon emission continue to rise uh, unless you uh, intervene uh, and uh, put in uh, uh, some policies uh, to uh, especially to uh, replace uh, greenhouse greenhouse gas emitting technologies and, and fuel yeah um but development of affordable renewable and alternative technology takes a long time and maybe too late to save the world yeah but luckily it seems that um solar photovoltaic has, uh, has gone down yeah, in cost and that has helped a lot and you can see in malaysia too we already uh, implemented uh, the large scale solar one two and and now in the process of uh, establishing the large scale solar three and soon they'll be bidding for large scale solar four but i'm not sure which which uh, ministries used to be the ministry which is uh, was uh, headed by dr abdul rahim nik dato eh? <laughs> <laughs> under mewa mewa under mewa <laughs> very <laughs> mewa <laughs> and water <laughs> yes what was happening there eh? anyway I'm not sure whether they have even looked at the at the plan. Yeah, so there is an urgent need to develop a method, yeah, of technology selection that is more effective, and that depends on higher values, so that future technology will be safer and cleaner. Right now, uh, we talk about um, economic uh, development. Yeah, uh, we need economic development because we need to develop the country. And it from most likely involve industrialization. So, uh, yeah, most of our foreign direct investment are for industry, yeah, mainly. Uh, well, some are for real estate, yeah, but uh, many a lot on industrialization, which is using natural and human resources and manufacturing te technology to produce products and services on a large scale at competitive cost. Okay, so that's what um, investors want, right? They want to uh, sell product and services uh, at competitive cost, yeah, so that they can earn some profit. Now, in in Islam, the use of natural resources is term tasheer, uh, yeah, sahara, yeah, comes from the word uh, sahara. Uh, um, so Allah uh, has. Uh, said that he subjected the the universe the uh, uh the sky and the earth yeah and also uh, animal to the world of man yeah so that man can use it for the animal as piece of burden uh, for anything in the on earth yeah they can use it for their own uh, but yeah and there are two words there Tashir and Tashlil. I have developed this a long time ago in 1989, 1990, yeah. And um, the, um, the word Talala and Sahara have similar meaning, 
but some slightly uh, there's some slightly different semantic meaning but uh, almost all of them uh, means uh, the subjection of uh, uh, <coughs> human and natural resources for exploitation by mankind yeah so so it it's halal for us to exploit because that's what uh, Allah has said yeah we can use natural and human resources yeah um, um, so Islam justifies the industry use of natural resources for the benefit of mankind within the limits of the Sharia yeah the Sharia means the actual uh, laws yeah the hudud and qisas and also takzir um, as well as uh, which is uh, uh, normally people don't look at yeah most people thought that you know uh, we only have to obey the sharia and we are okay but then the sharia for example hudud and qisas are only for very serious crime yeah and then takzir it's up to us, yeah, uh, through legislation and so on, yeah. But in the case where you don't have in the Sharia itself, as well as in the Tazi, you need another source of, um, shall I say, another way to determine uh, how to decide which type of energy, uh, which is ethics. And I would suggest that we use Islamic ethics, yeah. And uh, to to be able to uh, uh, to decide which uh, of the technology to be used, because uh, you might not have uh, anything in the Sharia or in the Tazi to uh, prevent you from uh, choosing the wrong technology. Yeah, because there are some grey areas, and there are also some uh, uh, conflicts of interest um, from many parties, uh, the environment. Uh, people, uh, investors, uh, stakeholders, as they call it now, and and also uh, the balance with the environment. So you need, uh, other than the Sharia, you need uh, some ethic, which I will perform in, in this presentation. Yeah. But we, we could also um, treat the Sharia as uh, not just only the conventional laws of Hudud and Christos and, and even the Takze, but it's also a, a dynamic legal system uh, that could solve a legal problem of modern life brought by brought about by technological change. Yeah, um, and this I, I think uh, what um, Sheikh uh, Al Al Alama um, Yusuf Karadawi meant yeah, about uh, uh, how uh, the fig depends on the situation yeah new situation that has never occurred during the prophet's time or during the 1400 years of uh of history like islam history yeah um uh, then uh, the shia can still solve it yeah but in case the shara couldn't then you need to to do to use some other means for example uh, islamic ethics uh, to to get it done yeah so this is our earth yeah it's very precious um it's the only one uh and uh, if you if you don't choose proper technology you will destroy the environment and you might like you might not get a green and blue and white uh, uh, uh <coughs> planet but you get a you know red planet like uh, mars yeah which has lost all its its water yeah, and all its uh, life as well. All right, let us look at the, since engineering and technological artifacts impact directly on the environment and the ecological system, uh, we need to, to look at the Islamic understanding of ecology, yeah, and, and must be clear yeah, before uh, we understand how technology artifacts should be invented, yeah. So I <coughs> developed this uh, uh, some understanding of ecology some time ago as well. Um, so it's based on an understanding of at least four main things. The first one, of course, is uh, Tawheed, uh, Rububiyah, 
that Allah is the sole creator, the Rob and owner and custodian of the universe and all creatures in it. Yeah, so that's very clear because we are all Muslims, so we believe in Tawheed. So uh, Allah is the owner and creator of the whole world, including the world we are in, which is Earth. Yeah, and also the sacred nature of the universe. Yeah. There is some um, some difference in opinion about this. Yeah. Um, uh, if you look in the Quran, for example, in the Surah Al Haqqah, Al -Haqqah verse 69, you'll see that the universe is uh, treated as something sacred yeah? um, because it was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, in every creation, there is the ayat of Allah, yeah, and therefore it is uh, sacred, yeah. But, um, and uh, what is happening uh, in the West is what Nasser, Sayyidina Nasser called the desacralization of nature. Yeah, desacralization of nature. So uh, the Western uh, uh, people have have not treated um, or have not regarded or have lost uh, the um, the uh, <coughs> notion of sacrality yeah, of of nature of the universe. So when it's no, no longer sacral, no longer sacred, then you can you can destroy it at will. Yeah? And that's the reason why uh, Western uh, people or you know uh, doesn't really care about nature. Even even not just Western people, everyone yeah um, have not uh, treated nature as it should be. If uh, we retain the notion of a sacred nature, then we would have we will not have destroyed it. But of course, there is also another interpretation um, which is slightly different. Yeah, um, Said Najib al said that uh, uh, nature has its own penunggu. Uh, uh, so traditional societies uh, would uh, uh, pray to all these uh, nature uh, forces, right? natural forces. Uh, whether it is a, a king or whatever, yeah, and Islam came to 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 remove this uh, what do you call it paganism, uh, uh, mythology yeah? of uh, penunggu in the uh, every uh, natural object. Yeah, uh, in that sense, um, it's a, a different uh, interpretation. Yeah, uh, of that. But what is meant by 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 Surah Al Haqqa is, uh, is the sacrality of nature itself uh, as a whole, uh, not because it has penunggu or anything, but it by itself is already second without having all this uh, uh, what do you call it uh, uh, pagan uh, association with uh, natural forces or genes, so on. The third one is of course the existence of communities or uh, umat yeah, in the in the quran um it, the, the quran used the word umat yeah umat for for all the creatures of the earth yeah, in one of the uh one of the ayat i forgot to read here um, yeah so the concept of umat yeah uh, it's not only uh, for mankind yeah? umat is not just the umat Islam atau umat, uh, yeah, umat also being used for communities of creatures, yeah. So it's like uh, it's living, yeah. Umat means uh, a group. Kalau kita cakap umat Islam, yeah, there's a group of people living uh, the life of of uh, a Muslim, yeah, and we have networking between us between. Uh, each of us, you have uh, families, you have friends, and so on. Yeah, and you have a community, right? And umma. So, all the creatures, whether living or not, have their own uh, communities. Uh, this is the the um, the uh, picture yeah, being given by Allah in the Quran. Um, this word for creature, umma for creatures, it only appears in one one ayat. I will give it later. Yeah? And, and then, of course, um, the maintenance of balance. Because this, this concept of balance, yeah, 
Mizan is uh, in the Quran, yeah. Alan Am and also Al Mizan and so on. You will see the word Mizan, and then another word which is derived uh, Tawazun. Yeah? Balance is just uh, something being balanced by another. In equilibrium, there is an interaction between two or more uh, uh, creatures or umat of creatures, yeah, which will be maintained at a balance, at an equilibrium, yeah, uh, within the universe, yeah. So, concept of mizan and tawazun, yeah. Uh, and then the umat of uh, creatures, yeah. Uh, so, they, they are actually living communities, yeah of creatures so you can uh, the next time you go uh, go out yeah you see communities of grasses communities of of sand yeah different type of sands you have different communities of sand rocks and, and so on yeah and i think um the sufis would be the one who could see this yeah? after returning from uh the experience of uh what is wujud yeah after coming back to the real world they will they will see this uh reflection of allah ayatullah in the communities of the ummats of the uh, of the creatures living or not living okay. now since the creation of mankind is dwarfed by the creation of the great varieties of creatures and the huge expanse of the universe Mankind should realize his own insignificant position compared to all the creatures and the universe and should be in awe of them. And therefore, destruction by mankind of sacred ummat of creatures in the universe as a result of technology use in industry, what I also call it as fasad fil ar. Yeah? So, fasad fil ar in the Quran too doesn't mean only uh, doing. Uh, facade on men yeah on people yeah? but also doing facade on the environment itself so that's why the the term is facade fill out yeah? not facade fill uh, uh in sun or whatever yeah because it's not just men but the whole uh, of nature the, yeah the whole of the earth yeah facade fill out and that would diminish the praising of Allah, yeah, because all these creatures constantly praise Allah. That's what the Sufi will see uh, when he comes back from Waratul uh, Wujud, come back and will see all these creatures. Their destruction also destroys the balance and equilibrium they had maintained. So the function of these creatures, the ummat of creatures, is to maintain the mizan and the equilibrium, the mizan and the tawazun, yeah, in the in nature. So once you destroy parts of them, yeah, there won't be any more uh, network of communities that support the mizan, yeah. So we'll de you destroy it, and that will cause apocalyptic natural disasters, yeah. So we always think about why we had, uh, uh, you know. Uh, <coughs> sorry, flooding, yeah, natural disasters like flooding, earthquake, yeah, volcan volcanic eruption, uh, landslide, yeah, and so on. Yeah, this is because we have destroyed the balance. We destroyed the community of Mahlu, yeah, community of uh, hawk of the of the creatures, and and. And that destroy the balance, yeah. And that balance uh, uh, result in apocalyptic natural disasters, which we could say as a punishment, yeah, of Allah on mankind, mankind for committing the fasad fil ar, yeah, fasad fil ar. So it's it's something that um, we, uh, I think, if we have this understanding of the eco ecology and ecosystem. Uh, it would help us to to, uh, to 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 help select the technology, the most suitable technology that won't destroy any of these uh, communities of creatures and and the 
balance and equilibrium of nature. All right. Now, uh, in order to do that, we need to have some sort of uh, ethical theory, theory of ethics. So I'll just give a summary. It's not going to be exhaustive. Rohan, and can we, uh, Rohan, can we have uh, 10 minutes more yes. to go? 10 minutes more to go? Can we conclude on 10, within 10 minutes? Oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I will just go three. three, three. All right. So the, um, you have from Aristotle down to uh, Kant um, and then Locke and then uh, Mill. Yeah? Those are the Western ethical philosophy. Um, and uh, has been used by uh, the West yeah, to look at the uh, how to select their uh, technology yeah, uh, from a virtue ethic in Aristotle, and then you have a more humanist and rationalist ethics um, uh, up down to the uh, utilitarianism of Mills. Uh, Islamic ethics, yeah. Uh, of course, in Islamic ethic, we need to establish what is a uh, good. Yeah, what is what is good? Yeah. So we have so many uh, term: albir, al hasana, yeah, or hasanat, khaira or khairat, the yeah, plural there. Yeah. Um, and um, um, <coughs> which uh, is not only uh, to get happiness in the world, but also to get happiness in the hereafter. So it's slightly different from Aristotle. Yeah? So uh, the word uh, happiness is called al-sa'ada. Yeah? Al so right action, al-amal al-saliha, that produces a good, yeah? uh, al-bil, hasanat, and khairat. There's some semantic difference between these three, uh, which I'm not going to discuss, uh, would not only achieve happiness in the world, but also happiness in the hereafter. So I'm referring to the two uh, great uh, ethical philosophers, Ibn Maskawai and Al-Ghazali. Yeah? And of course, you can, uh, I will share this uh, uh, slide with you later on. And, um, <clears throat> and that's why uh, the ulama had to be fair and equitable to human after acknowledging that Allah governs the universe. So you can see that the main um, akhlaq that should uh, a Muslim has is al-adalah, not the other one, because the al-adalah, which is justice, is the main one that will determine the rest. Now, the problem with our teaching of akhlaq, we teach some, something else, yeah? We teach only the periphery akhlaq, but we don't teach how to actually develop and become through a uh, Muslim, and that has to come through uh, al-adalah, and to get out of the last, you, you need wisdom, al-hikmah, and courage. Yeah, you must have courage. Yeah, you are not coward. You, you have to, to be courageous. And then you need temperance. Yeah? That's why. Right. Um, and then, of course, uh, the story about uh, man is a khalifa, and therefore he is to be uh, trust to keep the universe and creatures yeah, as, as a khalifa, and that's why uh, engineers uh, involved in proper taski and tazli should have appropriate moral virtues of justice, honesty, trust, and integrity. These four akhlaq, it's very important. Yeah? And then the way to cultivate virtues or good moral character is by cultivating spiritual self um, <coughs> um, through the inculcation of adab, yeah? Uh, tadib uh, or tarbiyah uh, or, or self verification or ta and tazkia. Yeah? Uh, tazkia is more uh, uh, tasawf type of training. Yeah? So uh, you you can get these virtues by uh, going through uh, this uh, tadib or tar tarbiyah or tazkia. If you don't have this, I don't think you can actually get it. Now, um, so Clean, low carbon energy technology is is a good, yeah. Is a is good by themselves, yeah. Al bil, al hasana, or al khairat, yeah, because they are directly or indirectly renewable by solar radiation without emitting air pollutant or greenhouse gases, which could cause uh, global warming and climate change, yeah. 
and similarly uh, renewable biomass yeah hydrogen energy that produce water only is also a uh, good so things that would um, would not cause uh, disaster or, or to maintain balance in nature is a uh, good in itself yeah? so you, you don't have to prove that uh, renewable energy is is a good it's already good by itself yeah um, So um, now, what I'm suggesting is to convert to transform from a fossil fuel or fossil energy intensive economy to one which is uh, electric hydrogen energy re renewable electric hydrogen energy uh, uh, system. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we want to do. So this is hydrogen economy. Um, if you use renewable hydrogen, you uh, produce it by using renewable energy on, on your left, produce hydrogen, and then it is being used, and the hydrogen will convert into water, and then you can split the water again by using renewable energy, like solar and hydro. Yeah? Um, and you can have grey hydrogen, so at the moment, uh, most uh, of hydrogen being produced in the world is called grey hydrogen because um, it also produces carbon dioxide eh, from steam reforming, uh, gasification and steam reforming or pyrolysis. Yeah, This all will produce carbon, carbon dioxide. So when you produce hydrogen, you also produce CO2, right? So most countries that are going into hydrogen economy would use this grey hydrogen now because the technology is mature and uh, the hydrogen is quite cheap. I'll show the, you the, the prices later on. And to jumpstart the hydrogen economy. So Japan, South Korea, China would like to get uh, hydrogen uh, from uh, uh, gray, gray hydrogen resources uh, like this. And the next one would be uh, blue hydrogen, which is with uh, carbon uh, sequestration, yeah? carbon storage, okay, carbon storage. And um, that would be blue hydrogen because we get rid of the CO2. We are not uh, emitting the CO2 into the atmosphere. We are going to use it or store it uh, in the ground or use it uh, for some other purpose, yeah. So you have CCR and uh, CCS, yeah? uh, carbon capture and storage or sequestration or carbon capture and uh, utilization or recycle recy recy reuse yeah. um, green supply uh, hydrogen supply chain yeah is uh, you can see the the sources are all renewable biomass with energy solar energy uh, wind energy uh, ocean thermal energy yeah uh, or tech yeah uh, from uh, and PC photoelectrochemical cell. Um, the most established and mature technology are from the top, yeah? so biomass quite established. Wave, solar, wind, yeah. OTEC is uh, going to be established soon by Propaka, and then of course photoelectrochemical cell is the least established. Um, but it would be uh, the photoelectrochemical cell technology would be called the uh, what we call the holy grail of of um, of uh, solar energy, uh, sorry, of hydrogen energy, because if you can solve and get a very efficient photoelectrochemical cell, then um, you you could produce uh, hydrogen, uh, renewable hydrogen, uh, at uh, very low prices. Yeah, because it's a direct um, splitting of water directly in one cell. Yeah, uh, whereas for the solar energy uh, using photovoltaic cell, you need an electrolyzer to, uh, you can see the electrolyzer here in the middle, right? Um, that uh, you need to convert to hydrogen. Now, if you look at the cost, blue blue and gray hydrogen, um, uh, the, the technology are quite uh, efficient, yeah? Up to 80%, you can see on your top left. And then the green hydrogen is a bit expensive, 
I mean, uh, less uh, efficient, yeah, 30% uh, compared to 80, yeah? 30 to 40%. And photo commentation is quite uh, low as well. Um, and then for zero um, uh, emission, zero carbon or low carbon or zero carbon, uh, even more more uh, efficient actually for if you have electrolysis, yeah. But the holy grail technology like photoelectrochemical cell are still very low efficiency, yeah. Uh, photosynthetic water splitting is also quite low, yeah. But um, uh, decentralized electrolysis is quite high efficiency, around 70, uh, you can go up to 70% efficiency, yeah. Uh, that's in terms of efficiency. Um, so what we want to is to develop the green hydrogen technology and the uh, zero carbon energy, uh, hydrogen energy to match the blue hydrogen cost, uh, efficiency, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so you need to go up to 80%. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, right. And cost, you can see that um, blue hydrogen cost is only one dollar per kilogram eh? but um, uh, green hydrogen uh, dark fermentation costs nothing yeah because it uses uh, wastewater but but in terms of volume it cannot match yeah because if you look at biogas uh, it's you need a lot of pome for example to produce a kilogram of of uh, biogas yeah so you could only use locally you can't use uh, any yeah um Corn, it could be done because corn is produced on a very large scale, uh, but the cost is quite high. Yeah, and then there are new technologies, uh, microbial electrolysis cell and photo fermentation. Yeah, uh, which is um, about twenty dollars. Yeah, and then for green hydrogen, electrolysis is quite competitive. Yeah, it's about two dollars per uh, per kilogram. Yeah, uh, per kilogram, but for bigger uh, on larger electrolyzer system, um, you might get up to about fifteen dollars per kilogram. Yeah, uh, there's no cost yet for photosynthetic uh, water splitting, but for 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 photoelectrochemical cell, it's up to twenty four dollars uh, uh, per kilogram. Yeah, it's quite expensive. Now all the uh, OECD countries have their own roadmap. Uh, you see the uh, European hydrogen roadmap, and you can see that in the uh, earlier part, they, they use uh, hydrogen from hydrocarbon. Yeah, uh, the the same with uh, the Japanese roadmap. Uh, you see on the left, it's uh, uh, you can use grey hydrogen. Yeah, um, and and then in the middle too uh, will be uh, uh, greener hydrogen and then around 2040 full scale carbon free hydrogen yeah so japan wants a lot of hydrogen and you you will see that uh, brunei is now now sending this uh, uh, hydrogen to japan yeah i'll show you yeah so this is the original hydrogen roadmap in 2006 yeah but of course it has been superseded by a lot of other things the you can see the first part from 2005 2010 was included in the uh, rm9 and the highway demo we uh, went to Un unido to get funding from jeff it came back in 2012 but it was hijacked by Pusat Tenaga Malaysia at that time and become the Hydrogen become Green Tech uh, because they want electric uh, vehicle, right? So they hijacked uh, that Unido uh, fund uh, from Jeff to do electric vehicle. And you can see some electric uh, vehicle in Putrajaya. Have you seen it? Anyone? Huh? Dr. Rahim? I saw in the paper, only paper cutting. <laughs> ah, NEDO, NEDO. They yeah. did it NEDO. <laughs> ah, New Energy Development Authority of uh, Japan. Agency, sorry. Uh, driven ah. by Dr. Mahade. Huh? 
Yeah, so that was hijacked from us. Part of it lah, part of it. Part of it come from Japan and so on, but the, in 2012, it was hijacked. We we already have the the, the plan, but the, the problem is, of course, Unido required that local company has to take it up. Hmm. But uh, at that time, Petronas says, we don't do hydrogen, period. So when we went there with might, we just took coffee lah. And then hmm. we went to Proton, they just send us an engineer. Yeah. Hmm. And they say, we, we don't have it in our road, man. So you know, they say, no, we cannot do it. But with electric vehicle, there's so many interested parties, local part, local uh, companies that are interested to, to join. So uh, that's another reason why the hydrogen energy highway demo couldn't take off. Although the money has come back at in 2012, a bit late, should be in 2009, um, but it was hijacked. Yeah. So the provision in the RM9 tu tak boleh buat lah. So uh, it was hijacked, and then the next KSU just forget about this uh, uh, solar uh, roadmap. Is there the, the 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 document is still there, but uh, he doesn't care. The next Halim lah, Halim juga. Yeah, uh, Halim. Halim. Yang replace uh, Halim Shafi. Uh, he doesn't want to see us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so after that, tak buat lah. So this is the problem with uh, I think uh, the drive net tahu lah ko, tahu ayah. This is one of the big problem. You change your KSU or change your ministers. If he's not interested, he'll just uh, NFA. Very simple. Yeah? NFA. No, but the action. Forbid, you know, the the last KSU of KETA forbid, yeah, forbid uh, anyone discussing hydrogen. <laughs> Only the KSU can discuss it. <laughs> okay. So, so we have five minutes more to go from. <laughs> five minutes. Okay. So I will just fast through, go through. This is the for few, sir. Uh, this is this is the new one sorry and uh, this is the one 2017 so we are still at the bottom uh, left there Maybe, three years ago huh? three years ago uh, three years ago but <laughs> we are already done coach and standard uh, policy support we are doing the policy policy guideline mm -hmm. and the human resource of course we are producing a lot of phds and masters and then we are also um, now having a uh, market entry uh, product uh, so we are now uh, up to uh, 2020s lah, yeah. Uh, convenient market entry, human capacity. So and uh, AEM PM electrolyzer for green hydrogen now being developed, and then the MC power bank are all developed on the way for commercialization. Yeah, but the only thing is we need to get uh, a party, a commercial company to actually do it, and we have got it uh, from Petronas too. Uh, that's the AEM electrolyzer lah for green hydrogen that I'm developing for Petronas, right? Now, it seems that so many companies are knocking on our door. They want a piece of this action. So, it's good lah. So, um, Indonesia. This is uh, Indonesia. They, I produce a lot of the, the graduates who in fuel cell and they return to Indonesia and they have developed so many things, yeah? And you can see, for example, they already got a uh, uh, development of fuel cell application at Barong and Serpong. Yeah? They managed to get Toshiba to collaborate with them and already installed. And the thing that um, the thing that they have done very well, yeah, is the uh, you can see uh, on the left there. On the left, there's a picture of people looking at a, a box, right? That box is actually the um, fuel cell application for Telco Tower, yeah? for Telco Tower. And they have already installed uh, close to 1,000 units already at Telco Towers. We only have one here in Malaysia, yeah, at MCMC and Technology Park Malaysia. They have quite a few hundreds already, nearly 1,000, yeah? And they have one Toshiba uh, hydrogen production system, yeah? And, and and you can see they, they by 2022, they will have storage fuel cell development, storage yeah, for fuel cell, and then transfer of knowledge from Toshiba, yeah? And 
then uh, laboratory accreditation, hydrogen system for transportation. This is 2024, yeah? 2024, Indonesia is going to have fuel cell car, hydrogen, yeah? Hydrogen uh, filing st filling station, fuel cell vehicle, and so on. And most of their people are trained by, by Malaysia. But Malaysia doesn't want doesn't want uh, our our graduates yeah, uh, to 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 go to develop the the fuel cell industry. Now, as I said, uh, Japan wants um, wants uh, uh, a lot of hydrogen. So you can actually uh, see that Australia Australia is planning to sell them. Yeah, we have started uh, this year pilot plan. Yeah. Uh, gasify the brown coal, liquefy it, and then transport by uh, tanker. Yeah? Um, Norway is also doing it, but they use water electrolysis. Yeah, again the same type of thing. Yeah? Brunei pilot in January 2020. Yeah, they have done it. This is with Chioda. Uh, so what happened is they get the uh, hydrogen uh, from steam forming, and then they use that hydrogen to hydrogenate toluene yeah they get toluene from japan yeah and then they they add hydrogen onto the onto the uh, toluene to to form methyl cyclohexane and then they transport the liquid methyl oxygen to japan and then they dehydrogenate take away the hydrogen and use it and then send back the toluene to back to brunei now it's happening now, right? It's happening now. So Petronas is very late. Yeah, uh, I've already asked Petronas uh, for quite some time already. Yeah, this this what my suggestion for Petronas. Yeah, you can start off with hydro uh, with uh, natural gas. Yeah, but instead of Petronas, we have Sarawak government. Okay. Sarawak government says we have a lot of hydro, we have a lot of water, so we are going to export hydrogen from Sarawak by using our um, hydro electric power, yeah, okay, and electrolyzer to to and liquefy it and then send it off to, yeah, because um, the technology for liquefaction is similar to LNG and there's a lot of LNG in Sarawak, yeah, so they could learn from. LNG. I mean, there are so many Sarawak engineers now uh, at the MLNG in Sarawak. Yeah, uh, one of them is my former student. Yeah, he's heading uh, LNG, so it's not difficult for him to to come up with a liquefaction plant for hydrogen in Sarawak. Yeah, in order to send that from Indonesia too. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, interest as well, but they haven't developed uh, anything yet. They are concentrating on deploying hydrogen in their own country now what about petrona what is the the vision of petronas well hydrogen is is a new uh, resource and in the short term uh, uh, petronas wants to use the hydrogen to decarbonize uh, their entire operation yeah so a lot of the petrona operation produce co2 yeah uh, when they uh, extract the oil, oil production or gas production, you now, most of the field contain a lot of CO2. So they need to separate it and then they have to know what to do with the CO2. So um, they could um, pump it back into into the ground, yeah, sequester it, but if there's too much of it, they might have to make it into something like uh, something that they could sell. But at the moment, there's nothing to, to be sold, so they use it to combine with CO2 and to produce uh, methane and methanol, which uh, they could uh, use it, yeah, to make. But the hydrogen must be uh, zero carbon emission hydrogen, and that's why they came to us, for us to develop electrolyzer technology for Petronas and in order for them to supply the zero emission or green hydrogen uh, to decarbonize their operation. But medium and long term, they, they are going to leverage on hydrogen uh, as a business. Yeah? Uh, in fact, I heard that the president and CEO of Petronas, uh, when he was in Davos, all the, oil, all the other oil companies were talking about hydrogen energy. And Petronas hasn't got one. 
So when he returned, he said, I want to have one demonstration plant for hydrogen. Yeah, I want to be at par with all those uh, oil companies like Shell and BP and so on. Because all they talk about in Davos is about zero emission hydrogen energy. Yeah, so a bit too late, but uh, it's not too late to actually uh, go into the market. The Naga National uh, is still uh, at um, very basic. Yeah, uh, they want to use it uh, to um, <coughs> decarbonize. That means to to convert the CO two. But they have not deployed a commercial uh, system yet. But they have developed it at their TMB research uh, facility. Uh, oh, we have three minutes. Yes, yes. Three, three minutes. Okay. And then, yeah. of course, uh, if you look at this hydrogen roadmap by uh, Shell. Uh, zero carbon emission is around 2070. Yeah, uh, just this is what COP COP 15 is all about. Yeah, uh, for the two degrees C, and this is one of the major supply of hydrogen. They have they they are the one who took over Malaysian oxygen. So Malaysian oxygen is now Lindy, and this is their their um, roadmap, and this is the market they are looking at. See, they want to get a share of this market, and you can see the figures up there. 2.5 trillion dollars worth of and 30 million jobs to, for the hydrogen economy yeah so it's a big thing if if muslim countries don't go into it they will lose out i mean they won't get a share of it yeah so companies like uh, lindy they're going to expand from just having 10 percent the the current thing they are doing now which is supplying uh industry yeah, maximum is only 10%, not much, which is uh, hydrogen feedstock, which is very, very, very small. And it's going to be 10% uh, of the expected global uh, in it, yeah? So, um, in Sarawak, the um, chief minister, uh, uh, who is, is something like Tun Mahade, he's very interested in new technology. He's the one who actually uh, brought hydrogen energy to Sarawak. So you can see um, at the top here, on the middle top uh, is the uh, electrolyzer. On the right is the uh, compressor. Yeah. Um, and then bottom, you can see the Hyundai car next to the uh, filling station. And then you can see the, the chief minister, uh, Bujang, uh, jo, Abang Jo. Yeah. Uh, filling up uh, Hyundai, and then you can see the the Hyundai, uh, the hydrogen filling station. And then the buses, the feature uh, feature buses from uh, China, yeah? and uh, 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 and I wrote I, I drove the car. You can see, yeah, in Kuching, yeah. If you go to Kuchen, you can ride the bus, but not the car. Ah, the bus is free. It's, it's open to the public. So it's it's very nice car. It's an electric car, right? And um, so you can see it's, it's uh, silent. Yeah. Uh, at this time, the car cannot go on the road because JPJ has not uh, has not approved the the road tag and, and the 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 license lah. So. Uh, now I think they, they have already approved, so you can see this car a lot, yeah, uh, in the in Kuching. Yeah, if you go to Kuching, but you can't ride on it, but you can ride the bus. There are three buses. The three buses will be going around the uh, Kuching. Yeah, these are all UKM uh, researchers. Yeah, we we have uh, the the commentary on this. Yeah, so um. And moving forward, as you say, you can see uh, Kuching is going to have a hydrogen fuel cell electric train soon. Yeah? And then uh, also a hydrogen production plant. Yeah? This is what uh, Abang Joe said. Uh, we have the uh, natural resources. We have a lot of water. We have a lot of uh, hydropower. So we can export hydrogen. So this is what his mind. So he's much further than Tone. Tone came to, to my lab, I think four years ago, but he didn't he didn't bring anything. Yeah, he didn't um, 
come up with what Abang Jo is doing. Look, Abang Jo is convinced and he's doing it. Yeah. So uh, we are quite happy about that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Dr. Waramli. Assalamualaikum. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can you stop the share the screen, uh, Prof. Waramli? Uh, yeah, you can stop. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, now I open to the, uh, not the floor, but to the virtual world to ask question. Prof. Rahim, Nick, you want to ask question? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. Fauzan, and thank you very much, uh, Prof. Wan Ramli, for your yeah. very comprehensive and clear presentation. Uh, you are the consistent proponent of hydrogen energies in Malaysia. Yeah. Well, maybe after maybe the the tobacco to to take the floor. But uh, since uh, so much be done in terms of research by Malaysian researcher and university, and we missed the boat when uh, we put up uh, policy document when submitted to the nation. But anyhow, we we need to start again um, to get this work being uh, recognized and to convince the ministry now, the ministry of ministry of energy Mewa. and resource. Yeah. Yeah. So so that. Because on two factors mentioned. First, we need to find an uh, efficient fuel and also that can reduce decarbonize Malaysia. As you know, Malaysia by 2014, we produce about 230 million in terms of GHG emission. Mm -hmm. And we have submitted to United Nations, we have to reduce this and the NDC, National Determined uh, Contribution. You mentioned uh, NDC. Now we are at the state of NDC already. We submitted in 2016. Uh, uh, we have to, every four years, we have to repeat. So under this document, we have to in include what are the steps taken and policy measures required by Malaysia in order to reduce. We have to reduce by the year 2030 about 50 million uh, C uh, CO2 equivalent. Therefore, maybe uh, we can try again to convince the minister, the new minister now, maybe new uh, new brooms, uh, new broom sweeps clean to convince to include this first in the policy document that submitted to the nation. So th that these are the potential technology to be used. And secondly, only with, uh, we talk about the implementation on the ground. So maybe uh, that's my suggestion, uh, Prof. Huh? Thank you, Datuk. Uh, now I have uh, the question of, uh, from Zaki. It is interesting to know the estimated projected capacity or best case scenario to produce hydrogen would fulfill the percentage of energy demand of for Malaysia. Uh, this is from Razaki. By the way, uh, Datuk Warambi, you have the audience from Indonesia, Pak Habib from uh, Muhammadiyah, and we have uh, Arabo Muhammad Farid, uh, our uh, senator in uh, Cambodia also uh, mm -hmm. following us, and also a few others. Uh, and we, I think we have your students, uh, uh, two uh, uh, your, of your students, uh, non Malay, uh, I guess uh, he's also joining us just now. Okay, talk uh, about uh, Prof. Dr. Waramli. The answers. Can he can he hear us? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Prof. Waramli. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Prof. Uh, Maybe can Prof. Prof. get response from the. People for then later on, person actually can respond. Yeah? Okay. Uh, another question from uh, others. Uh, we have. Uh, while waiting for uh, other others out there to ask, maybe Prof. <coughs> Rambi can answer it. Pro one. Uh, what was the, the question again? I. Uh, Doctor Nick, you you are the first one. <laughs> okay. okay uh, Make it short that. and sweet. Okay. Uh, Malaysia has submitted our NDC, National Determined uh, yeah. consideration, for, uh, consideration Contribution, last time 2016. In this document, we included what are the policy uh, response in order to reduce our carbon emission. But inside that uh, document, we have not included renewable energy, including uh, hydrogen, hydrogen fuel. So for the next submission, something this year, maybe it's a high time for us to convene the minister to include this as part of our effort in order to reduce uh, GHG because it is efficient and also because of uh, maybe uh, safe as opposed to other alternatives. So that's my suggestion. Yes, um, actually um, the um, Ministry of Economic Affairs just uh -huh. before the PN 
this is during during ph uh, during ph time um, uh, the academy of science malaysia and mestec has actually uh, proposed um, in the uh, science and technology and and uh, uh, technology development in the 12 Malaysia plan to include hydrogen uh, technology uh, uh -huh. development uh, as well as hydrogen uh, energy lah, uh, as one of the uh, but uh, <coughs> because of COVID-19 the discussion and also PN uh, new government so uh -huh. the discussion has stopped and in fact there's no more Ministry of Economy Affairs we are back to EPU and and at the present moment, we don't know whether the MITI is going to take it up or uh, uh, EPU. So it's all in limbo now. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, so is the, the, the preparation for the 12 Malaysia plan. I believe EPU still uh, will, will do it because most of the staff are in EPU. I don't think they, will, they, they are moved to... Uh, they will stay in the PU because the Ministry of Economy Affairs actually uh, occupied the same building as the e former EPU. Right. So now it's back to EPU lah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure whether they they have reinstituted EPU or not. Mm -hmm. And now it's under uh, Dato uh, Mustafa. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have already uh, the Academy of Science Malaysia. Uh, and Mestec, I mean the previous Mestec, has already mm. suggested uh, hydrogen okay. energy in the 12 Malaysia plan. Mm -hmm. uh, from uh, R&D and technology development and commercialization of technology, as well as preparation for hydrogen energy implementation later on. Because mm -hmm. uh, it, it won't be in, in the 12 Malaysia plan, uh, it will be in in the next uh, field. But there will, there will be market entry uh hydrogen uh, application yeah and in indonesia they have done it successfully for uh the uh uninterruptible power supply for their telco yeah? for the telco tower mm. uh, transceiver uh, station eh? transceiver mm. station uh in Jogja, in jakarta and so on yeah mm. because they they always uh experience uh uh, power blackout or, or brownout, so they, mm -hmm. they really need that. And uh, batteries uh, uh, has a problem, <coughs> a problem like uh, people stealing the battery, and then battery doesn't last very long. You need to replace them and so on. With fuel cell, um, uh, it's a uh, zero emission, and uh, you can uh, also do it by by technology. I mean, you can monitor it by technology and so on, and. Uh, uh, so far, it has been quite successful. Uh, mm. CEO of, of telecom companies in Indonesia are very, very good at uh, accepting new technology. But uh, tel uh, CEO uh, in, of uh, telecom and telecom, whatever, they are too conservative and don't want to, to really spend money and, and actually trust the technology. Mm -hmm. So Indonesia has gone forward, although they, they didn't start to sell i did it i trained their their professors now you know their professors and vice chancellors rectors and so on in indonesia who were my students and they have the industry to have all this yeah and the main uh, the main uh, driver in indonesia is bpt yeah bapa um bpt dr enia um who is the uh, a lady professor at, at bpt uh, who have pushed for hydrogen in Indonesia, yeah, and uh, it's going quite well, much better than in Malaysia. Malaysia, we have uh, reluctance from uh, companies, yeah, and and also from uh, Minister, Ministry of uh, Energy and Environment. They are too slow. Yeah, mm. they want to see other people do it first, and then, and then they will they will look at the successful one and then do it. Yeah, mm. but <laughs> if you are running a uh, uh, a company, you need to get a share of the market early. You don't wait, so that's the problem with our companies. They have to wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so suddenly we went to Davos and was shocked to find out that they don't talk about 
uh, gas reserve or yeah. oil green, reserve green and more. She talk about hydrogen. How much do you have? How much uh, your capacity in the next five years? Ah, uh, so if you don't have any, what are you going to talk about? Okay, thank Probably you. For... In the same forum with the big guys, you just keep silent. <laughs> uh. See, we have a uh, yeah, MGTC. Uh, Habib from uh, Bodo Bodo, Jakarta, you want to ask question from Indonesia? Uh, KPIT representative, yeah, go ahead, Habib. Assalamualaikum, Prof. Han Ramli. Yes. I'm happy to be in this uh, enlightening discussion, and I would like to express my sincere thanks and highest appreciation. Uh, after you presenting on the global scenario, and then the future scenario of the technologies and you came to the uh, well, selection of technology and then you mentioned about that we have to take into account not only ethics yeah, but also the, the whole worldview, Islamic worldview in terms of the Islam ecology and I would like to add something on the uh, context of happiness and uh, the human well-being and also the ethic of peace because uh, the issue of uh, what you call the energy is related to the whole issue of uh, peace in the of technology, in the of uh, economics, but uh, in the of the uh, human survival. So what I would like to share with you is uh, actually is uh, my personal reflection that what you have been doing, I mean, uh, uh, presenting is really comprehensive. And we should, in, within triple IT, we should spread uh, this idea uh, because ethics is not in the, what you call, in the vacuum, but ethics in the world with the choices, uh, in, including in the choices of the future uh, technology, future energy, because uh, it's related to the uh, global warming, related to the uh, climate change, and also the global peace. So I would suggest uh, that Professor uh, uh, Nordin, uh, yeah. could you please also uh, develop this uh, discussion uh, in the in terms of ethics, uh, but uh, with uh, uh, what do you call resource person, like Professor Wan Ramli and others. So thank you, Prof. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, 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 yeah, Prof. Wan Ramli. Yes, I think Pak pa, uh, Habib is expressing his uh, yes, yes appreciation and also yeah. his. Uh, uh interest uh, and also to suggest for tpit to develop the ideas further yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, Prof. Wan, uh, this uh question from chat room uh from brother zaki do we malaysia have the capacity to provide the hydrogen uh fuel uh we vis a -vis, uh, supply and demand do we have enough uh, uh supply if we have uh, big demand thank you well, it's a question of chicken and egg, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, this this is uh, this uh, uh, question doesn't arise in Japan, mm. right? They don't they don't ask the question of whether you will have the demand. They create the demand. They create. And the the, the thing is, in Japan, uh, I think the first country that will go full hydrogen uh, economy. Um, the industry is the one who is driving and the government is sort of uh, following the industry. You see Toyota, Toyota had developed an electric car in the 70s yeah, when uh, the Qatar government gave subsidies to uh, American company and car companies to build, uh, to build and produce electric car. Yeah, by the time Reagan came around, Reagan stopped that, and and so American companies stopped developing the electric car. But Toyota, Toyota uh, followed uh, uh, doing the uh, developing the electric car, but uh, they, they continued. Yeah, they didn't stop when Reagan came along. The American companies stopped, but the Toyota didn't stop. 
Toyota went on to produce hybrid, right? And they have done a lot of uh, studies because Toyota is a technology le leader as well as a market leader. Yeah, they are the largest uh, car manufacturers and the one that have the latest technology. Okay, whenever whenever they they start hybrid. Right, all the other car companies start to to follow. Right, so uh, had, I mean, Toyota is a, a leader, and in 2015 they have rolled out the commercial version of their fuel cell vehicle, the Mirai, the Mirai, yeah, and uh, they have opened the patent, the patent for fuel cell car. They have given it free for anyone who wants to uh, develop and sell. Uh, commercially uh, fuel cell cars. So now all the car manufacturers are scrambling <coughs> to uh, produce commercial uh, cars. So uh, the one that is now um, um, uh, following Toyota is Hyundai. Hyundai, the Koreans are very fast, right? Very fast follower. So you will see more of this uh, Hyundai and Toyota car on the road, right? So they will create the, the 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 market. They don't they don't ask question like, oh, do we have the demand? No, right? The technology leader will say, no, we will create the market. Doesn't matter if we lose a few billion. Now the level of of um, of uh, investment in uh, fuel cell car development is in the billions of dollars. You know, Mercedes has spent billions, Toyota has spent billions, uh, and so on. Right? They are not developing only cars, they are also developing uh, buses. And China companies have uh, already uh, commercialized their uh, hydrogen cars because um, uh, the Chinese government has stopped subsidizing electric cars. They are now subsidizing hydrogen fuel cell cars right? in China. So if China moves, uh, China, is, they have billions of people. See? So if they start doing fuel cell, Car and hydrogen energy, uh, we have to follow. Otherwise, we we don't get any anything. We, we need to develop the the technology so that we have a share of the market. All right. Now we don't have anything. Okay. Now uh, for hydrogen, only uh, Japan, China, Korea, um, Germany, of course, with uh, Mercedes and uh, uh, even even the U US pun tak 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 berapa ni because they are a bit they want to stop doing electric car and now trying to get into fuel cell car as well but but they probably probably wouldn't get that much market share the japanese will get most of it with the korean and china so uh where to get you look at um abang joe right everyone will tell him i mean you, you see some of the opposition uh don't uh, opposition i don't eh, in sarawak uh saying that this is a waste of money and so on but uh, Abanjo said no, he believes in this and we can do it because we have the uh, um, the resources, we have a lot of water Sarawak, if you've been to Sarawak, Sarawak have a lot of water, right? And then they have a lot of hydropower, right? So this is a good mix for Sarawak. So Sarawak, would, I, I would say will be successful if they will do it in uh, uh, hydrogen energy. And that's why they started the 